Thank you. All right, I'm going to read, uh, actually, it's a, it's a formal talk. It is because, and I'll probably go off script some, but it is because um, Frederick Douglass's ideas about photography are deep and complex, and um, I want you to really get the flavor of this. Um, we, we, um, it's been well known that he, he wrote some short pieces about photography. He wrote uh, in his newspaper about how it was important for black people to have pictures of themselves that were not denigrating, that, were, that showed n the beauty of their persons and the excitement of their lives. He wrote a piece called Pictures and Progress, which I will talk about. But it turns out, if you really look in his papers, and this is what somebody asked me just <coughs> before you asked me what started this, it was looking in his papers um, and finding ab about how much more he wrote than what we even yet know. Um, uh, and that's what, that's what started this. Um, so, uh, born a slave, Frederick Douglass paid particular attention to photography. Throughout his life, as we know, he sat for numerous photographic portraits and circulated them as widely as possible. He also wrote a number of articles and lectures on the subject of photography. His ideas about the uses of photography are different from those articulated by many of his contemporaries who were chiefly engaged by how well the camera reflected and cemented existing social relations. Like others of his generation, Douglas was interested in pictures of family sentiment, but at his most intense, he looked to photography for kindling rather than for kinship. During slavery, Douglas heard in the click of the shutter a promise of the shackles release. If black people could appropriate by means of the camera the power of objectification that slavery wielded, Douglas perceived that photography would become an agent of radical social change. After emancipation, Douglas thought that photography could be a tool for remaking the American imagination. Such photography was a visionary force, offering an important avenue for change. And scholars of photography need to attend more seriously to Douglas's contribution to the theory of photography. Most of what Douglas wrote on photography has not been yet widely read. In the present essay, I trace some of what is to be discovered about Douglas's ideas of photography by comparing his published lecture of 1861, Pictures in Progress, with the major revision that he made of that essay in 1865, which still exists only in manuscript. In particular, I believe that by closely reading and comparing these two pieces of writing, we can see how Douglas is in conversation with Abraham Lincoln over the image of the black man and the image of the American Union. It is also, I don't know if you saw Lincoln over mm -hmm. Thanksgiving break, mm -hmm. but those images are also very, very vivid um, to me at the moment. Photography is central to Douglas's conversation with Lincoln. Each lecture contains a timely response to one of Lincoln's inaugural addresses. In the first, which was written at the outset of the Civil War, Douglas is troubled by Lincoln's hesitation to arm black troops. He proposes that the new technology of photography would humanize the image of the enslaved so that black men might be more widely seen as suitable recruits to the Union forces. In Douglas's 1865 revision of the earlier essay, he encourages Lincoln and the country to anticipate the successful end of the war and to turn toward rebuilding the nation. Thus, there, he tries to describe how photographs could now disseminate a prophetic image of the nation. Photography could make a likeness of the more perfect union and the that, that the Constitution had originally failed to deliver. This is a distinctly different approach to the potential of photography than the one that is most in vogue right now among photography scholars. In Camera Lucida, Roland Barthes famously defined the three positions from which many critics today analyze the institutions of photography. That of the operator of the camera, the spectator of the photograph, and the spectrum, as Barthes calls it, or the target of the image. But in effect, in these two, pre and post, in his pre and post slavery engagement <coughs> in the 1860s, 
with Lincoln's two inaugural addresses, I think that Douglas excavated a fourth form, that of the revenant, or one who returns from the dead. The word revenant comes from the French revenir, meaning to come back, to come again, or to return. And historically, it has been used to express the uncanny sense of déjà vu, of something or someone previously thought to be absent or dead. It also contains within itself the French word rêve, or dream. And all of these are implicated in Douglas's sense of the possibilities of photographic art and technology. Douglas believed that the formerly enslaved could reverse what we loosely call the social death that defined slavery with another objectifying flash, this time creating a positive image of the social life of freedom. For one thing, a motivated photographer could deflect the reifying gaze back onto the oppressor. For another, and that's our to return, that's one of the revenant, to return or to send back. For another, if trained by oneself upon one's own self and people, the camera's gaze could undercut the slave power's ostensible truth that African Americans were only fractionally human, showing the fully realized consciousness that was there, of course, all along. In other words, the uncanny return of the socially repressed. And finally, photographs from around the world could reveal the scope of human similarity across difference, building an awareness of human commonality that had never before reached so deeply into ordinary, everyday experience. In other words, the dream, the rêve. Any of these interventions would be enriching, singly, all three together would support social revolution. From this vantage, photography sheds the melancholy fixation on death and loss with which Roland Barthes has taught us to imbue it. As an avatar of social progress, the photographic revenant enlivens the present and hails a better world. Both Frederick Douglass and Roland Barthes wrote their brilliant accounts of the nature of photography by the light of meditations on death. The death towards which Barthes was looking was individual, the death of his mother, a private loss for which photography was so personal a solace that Barthes would not print the image of, the, of his mother that he found in his book that was about the search for that image. But the death that concerned Douglas was massive, public and socially transformative. Upwards of 20 million had suffered and died under the slave system, and at least 620,000 more people were killed in the war undertaken to end it. Amid such <coughs> carnage, the position of the revenant that appeared to Douglas through photography was available to all who would seek an image of a new birth of justice by black inclusion in American society. The potential commonness of this vision, like a leaf of Whitman's grass, gave Douglas his hope for national renewal. So on December 3rd, 1861, Frederick Douglass responded to an invitation to give a lecture, like this one, in the fraternity course lecture series at Tremont Temple in Boston, with a highly uncharacteristic response. Normally, he was a powerful, extemporaneous speaker. This time, Douglass read his lecture aloud from a written text, and he apologized for so doing. The lecture was about photography. Douglas was an enthusiast of the invention. Americans at the time generally understood photography to be the product of the union of science with nature. To Douglas, this new kind of picture promised to remedy what he saw as badly distorted visual representations of black people made by white artists. Um, in his Tremont Temple talk, he emphasized how the invention of photography could be used for unraveling this problem of racist representation. Praising Daguerre as, quote, the great father of our modern pictures, Douglas celebrated photography among other advanced technologies of the age. He placed Daguerre in the company of other prominent inventors, such as Sir Richard Ockwright, James Watt, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Fulton, and Samuel F.B. Morse. Quote, if by means of the all-pervading electric fluid Morse has coupled his name with the glory, if by means of the all-pervading electric fluid 
Morse has coupled his name with the glory of bringing the ends of the earth together, sorry, I'm not getting this go right, and of converting the world into a whispering gallery. Daguerre, by the simple but all abounding sunshine, has converted the planet into a picture gallery. He argued that the art of mechanical reproduction was a natural phenomenon. He said, as munificent in the exalted arena of art as in the radiation of light and heat, the god of day not only decks the earth with rich fruit and beautiful flowers, but studs the world with pictures. And Douglas called attention to the social impact of the accessibility of such an invention. Daguerreotypes, ambertypes, photographs, and electrotypes, he said, good and bad, now adorn or disfigure all our dwellings. A man who nowadays publishes a book or ped peddles a patent medicine and does not publish his face to the world may almost claim and get credit may almost claim and get credit for a simple modesty. Next to bad manuscripts, pictures can be made the greatest bores. They are pushed at you in every house you enter, and what is worse, you are required to give an opinion of them. All these observations initially are within the realm of received opinion. Douglas, along with nearly everyone else at the time, is espousing here without irony a belief in photography's democratizing influence. He said, men of all conditions may see themselves as others see them. What was once the exclusive luxury of the rich and great is now within reach of all. The humble servant girl whose income is but a few shillings per week may now possess a more perfect likeness of herself than noble ladies and court royalty with all its precious treasures purchase, could purchase 50 years ago. This is a common claim that in the United States, the smallest town now has its picture gallery. With this figure of the humble servant girl, he's, got, he's into the realm of stereotypes. Okay, and, um, and that's where um, he stays until about a quarter of the way through the lecture. And then abruptly he changes course, declaring, quote, but it is not of such pictures that I am here to speak exclusively. Douglas wanted to take this discussion of photography somewhere else. This was one day after the second anniversary of the execution of John Brown. And it found the country nearly a year into the Civil War that the wily old warrior had sought to ignite. Immediately after Lincoln's election in January, seven southern states had seceded. In his inaugural address on March 4, 1861, Lincoln sought to persuade the South that there was no cause for war, even though Jefferson Davis had already been sworn in two weeks earlier as president of the Confederacy. Quote, Lincoln, we are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies, he stressed in his speech. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bond of affection. Particularly, Lincoln sought to persuade the Confederacy that he would not interfere with their right to own slaves. Quote, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the United States where it exists. I believe I have no right to do so, lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Unquote. In quick succession, Fort Sumter came under attack and more states left the Union. Douglas was appalled by Lincoln's inaugural speech. He did believe the slaveholder was his enemy and the war having finally begun, he felt it was imperative to dedicate it to ending the peculiar institution that Lincoln there seemed ready to protect. Thus, as he stood in Tremont Temple, taught reading about photography before the audience on the second anniversary of John Brown's death, Douglas feared for his vision of race and nation. In direct response to Lincoln's remarks nine months earlier, Douglas attacked as many of the arguments of the inaugural address as he could. It was essential to give up on the idea that slavery was legal and, quote, have done with the wild and guilty fantasy that man can hold property in man. Douglas told the audience that the country must, quote, lay the ax at the root of the tree and hurl the accursed slave system into the pit from which it came. He found Lincoln's address of the Union weak and dangerously conflicted. 
while I do not charge, as some have, that the government is conducting the war on peace principles, he said, it is plain that they are not conducting it on war principles. Chief among Lincoln's mistakes, according to Douglas, was his failure to enlist Southern slaves as soldiers. This could be fatal to the Union. Quote, we are fighting the rebels with only one hand when we ought to be fighting them with both. We are recruiting our troops at the North when we ought to be recruiting them at the South. We are striking with our white hand while our black one is chained behind us. We are catching slaves instead of arming them. We are repelling our natural friends to win the friendship of our natural enemies. We are endeavoring to heal over the rotten cancer instead of cutting out its death roots and fibers. We seem a little more concerned for the safety of slavery than the safety of the republic. The government at Washington has shouldered all the burden of slavery in the prosecution of the war and given to its enemies all its benefits. Douglas found a mechanical analogy that explained how time itself was out of joint. The country was like a broken clock whose machinery needed to be fixed. The cause of our troubles, he told the people, is deeper down than sections, slaveholders, or abolitionists. These are but the hands of the clock. The moving machinery is behind the face. The machinery moves not because of the hands, but the hands because of the machinery. To make the hands go right, you must make the machinery go right. The trouble is fundamental. But change was inevitable. Nature herself, he said, a picture of progress, was a rebuke to moral stagnation. In the age of invention, nothing stands today where it stood yesterday. There is no standing still, nor can there be. Political as well as technological realities were shifting. John Brown himself was an example of this process, quote, and the faith for which he nobly died was rapidly becoming the saving faith of the nation. Two years earlier, he pointed out John Brown's own son was hunted in Ohio like a felon, but now he is a <coughs> captain under the broad seal of the US <coughs> government. Meanwhile, those who came to torment John Brown in his jail cell, he said, stretched on his pallet of straw covered with blood, marred by saber gashes in the hands of his enemy, not expecting to recover from his wounds, that's John Brown, were now themselves accused of treason and rebellion. Photography, to Douglas, an emblem of human progress, was another such rebuke. Underlying Douglas's attack on Lincoln's inaugural is a theory of photography as revolutionary vision. For Douglas, the temporizing of Lincoln's defense of the legality of slavery in the slave states was just as much of a distortion of reality as the grotesque images that some white artists made of black faces and bodies, rendering them unacceptable to serve in the armed forces. Photographic seeing could help address that problem because it could help correct the distortions of black manhood that put the Union at risk. Viewed correctly, black men would come to life in the white imagination and Lincoln would find the soldiers that the Union needed to win the war and vindicate the government. Photographic seeing would also address the problem of moral stagnation. Douglas was sure that eventually slavery would be destroyed, in part by this very 19th century scientific progress of which photography was itself a symbol. In the, every bar of railroad iron a missionary, in every locomotive a herald of progress, the startling scream of the engine and the small ticking sound of the telegraph are like prophecies of hope and warnings to the system of slavery. Superstition and oppression will, uh, must get themselves away to the work murky shades of barbarism. A powerful new form of communication like the train and the telegraph, photography would, Douglas said, dissolve the granite bar barriers of arbitrary power bring the world into peace and unity, and at last crown the world with justice, liberty, and brotherly kindness. In his inaugural, Lincoln was standing in the way of progress. And Douglas said, he who despairs of progress despairs of the hope of the world and shuts himself out from the chief significance of existence and is dead while he lives. Photography could bring him back from this despair, a revenant. Inside of man also were images as well, and these too could be improved upon by the progress that was epitomized by photography. Rightly viewed, Douglas said, the whole soul of man is a sort of picture gallery. 
a grand panorama in which all the great facts of the universe in tracing things of time and things of eternity are painted. This picture making was the end and aim of science. It was the animating principle of the age. It would justify the war to end slavery and the future of the American nation. Now, so this talk that he gave at the Tremont Temple was not a success. The audience was impatient with Douglas's abstract reasoning. And you've heard, it's, a, it's, an abst it's abstract. And the audience was disappointed that he did not stick entirely to the sensational subject that he was famous for, abolition from the point of view of a former slave. One reviewer remarked that the audience was, quote, listless and unattentive. Only at the end of the lecture, said another reviewer, when he, quote, saved himself by switching off suddenly from his subject and pitching in on the great question of the day, did the audience become attentive and enthusiastic. Now, Douglas, of course, I'm arguing, had been pitching in on the war the entire time. But those who heard him couldn't place his thoughts about photography into that context, sharing his meditations on photography and speaking like a transcendentalist photographer, Douglas himself, it seemed to those who heard him, was out of place. But Douglas didn't cease to think about the uses of photography as prophecy. And in 1865, came another invitation to give another public lecture. And he responded by rewriting the text of that original talk. And he gave the theory of photography another try. Unlike the Tremont Temple lecture that he presented early in the war, this lecture was never reviewed, at least so long as I've been able to find. So I don't know if Douglas was more successful with his public this time around. But it is clear from the changes to the text that his thoughts had deepened. In the first place, when he gave the earlier lecture, he was not conscious of the prejudice that his audience would hold against a black man speaking theory about the subject of photography. Four years later, he certainly was more aware of the flashpoints revealed by the bad reviews. At the same time, he was equally, if not more engaged with the potential of photography in the field of reform. His fear of compromise was gone. Not only did Lincoln's re-election indicate that the Union would, after all, prevail, the sound defeat of his rival, General George McClellan, who had run as a peace candidate against Lincoln, promising to negotiate with the slave power, promised that at war's end, if McClellan was defeated, the country would unite around the end to slavery. Douglas now could say that, quote, the American people are not remarkable for moderation. That's what he was afraid of at first. They despise halfness. They will go with him who goes longest and stay with him who stays longest. What the country thinks of halfness and half measures is seen by the last election. We repudiate such men and all such measures. The people said to the Chickahominy hero, we do abhor and spurn you and all whose sympathies are like yours. And to Abraham Lincoln, they said, go forward, don't stop where you are, but go onward. Significantly, we can see, Douglas had also changed his opinion about Lincoln, whom he no longer thought of as the walking dead. In the second version of Pictures in Progress, Douglas was again in dialogue with the president, but this time he was concerned with photography's ability to replenish both the devastated nation and its exhausted leader. Douglas opened his revised version of Pictures in Progress by explaining that he was conscious that in the minds of his audience, the, the mind of his audience would be weighted down by the stupendous contest upon which he wrote, depends for weal or for woe, the destiny of this great nation. He said, the fact is that the whole thought of the nation during the last four years has been closely and strongly riveted to this one object, Every fact and every phrase of this mighty, every phase of this mighty struggle has been made the subject of exhausting discussion. The pulpit, the press, and the platform, political and literary, the street and the fireside, have thought of little else and spoken of little else all during these four long years of battle and blood. Yet even as he now openly acknowledged that it might seem to them, in quote, impertinence for him to speak at such a time, on the comparatively tri trivial theme of pictures, 
Douglas led his audience once again into complicated meditations on the meaning of photography by means of a series of inter-articulated claims about picture making that were far from trivial. Moving from one <coughs> perspective on the nation's free, fierce and sanguinary debate to another one, somber one, more commanding, and then to yet another, he again framed an argument by means of ideas about images until at last an entire vision, a panorama of the magnificent meaning of the mighty struggle came into view. At the summit of the second Pictures and Progress manuscript, he harmonized discordant or jarring elements of four years of bloodletting as successful as a scientific music that transcended wild and startling sounds in nature uh, that until then provided the only music to which the poor savage, and that's his language, was accustomed. The science was photography and the music was freedom. When Douglas wrote his second version of Pictures in Progress, this war was rapidly drawing to its close. Douglas thought the Confederacy was perishing, not only for the want of men and for the materials and munitions of war, but from a more radical exhaustion one which touched the vital sources out of which the rebellion sprung, he wrote. It had become evident that slavery, hitherto paramount and priceless, was far less valuable than an army, that the Negro can be far more useful as a soldier than as a slave. The slave power's supply of energy, like that moving machinery behind the face of the clock of the country that he had described in his earlier lecture, that power was broken the time of the Confederacy was doomed. Yet Douglas at that moment also recognized the exhaustion that threatened the Union. As he had in the Tremont Temple talk, he feared for the nation's well-being, but this time the reason was different. The tension of four years of war had narrowed the people's perspective. Like overstressed bows, he said, they needed to be unbent occasionally in order to retain their elastic spring and effective power. In this connection, his expansive thoughts about photography could be of use. He had no question that the war had been worth it, but he was worried especially about its cost to Lincoln. On the occasion of this second oath of office, despite clear signs to the contrary, Lincoln had refused to predict the Union's victory. The war was not yet officially over, and Lincoln claimed that, quote, this is, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first, precisely because this great contest still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, such that little that is new can be presented. Lincoln's second inaugural is pensive and subdued. He said, neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Douglas acknowledged the vital need to stay the weary and difficult course, but as if in answer to Lincoln, Douglas asserted that now was the time to develop a new and expansive view of what would have been accomplished when the war was over. Douglas said, the people can afford to listen for a moment to some other topic. There is no danger of being injuriously diverted from the one grand fact of the hour. The bow will be bent occasionally, unbent occasionally, in order to retain its elastic spring, and the same is true of the mind. Thoughts that rise from the horror of the battlefield, like the gloomy exultations from the dampness and death of the grave, are depressing to the spirit and impair the health. One hour's relief from the intense, oppressive, and heartaching attention to the issues involved in the war may be of service to all. The weary Union was in need of new perspectives. Somberly, Lincoln had acknowledged that the old, the old offense of slavery was dying, while God gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, with malice towards none and with charity towards all, Lincoln's best hope was that the nation would achieve a just and lasting peace. But Douglas thought that the American people could do more than bind their wounds. They should, quote, harness the moral chemistry of the universe to continue the work of progress. The elastic spring that Douglas now sought for the country 
would come once again from the contemplation of pictures. To a historian of photography, it's interesting that Douglas is still enthralled by Daguerre in that talk. And he talks in glowing terms about uh, uh, Daguerre and the French Academy and so forth and so on in progress. Um, but Douglas this time directly acknowledged that it was not customary for a former slave to speak about photography. Yet, with the war nearly finished, he was determined to show his audience that his was a black American's point of view on the photograph. Pardon me, Douglas told his listeners in maybe the tone of, uh, the co most complex tone of the entire second lecture, if I shall be found discoursing on Negroes when I should be speaking of pictures. But really, he told them he had little choice. When I come onto the platform, the Negro is very apt to come with me. I cannot forget him, nor would you, you, nor would you if I did. His friend Sojourner Truth, he confided, had said that she does not speak to tell people what they don't know, but to tell them what she herself knows. He would have to give the speech he was sent into the world to make. This would be, he said, an abolition speech about photography. What Douglas was trying to get across was that mon, one must differentiate freedom from slavery in one's mind's eye before one could produce it or procure it for oneself or others. He sought to demonstrate that image making, as in photography, painting, poetry, and music, was the means to this next emancipation. As Lincoln had hoped for firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, Douglas had hoped that photography would refocus the right that could be seen. Prophets, poets, and reformers are all picture makers, he said, and this ability is the secret of their power and of their achievements. They see what ought to be by their reflection of what is, and they endeavor to remove the contradiction. Pictures and progress, both versions taken together, is surely among the earliest extensive theoretical works on the uses of photography to be written from the <coughs> point of view of a former slave. From Douglas's perspective, American nature might be a vast and glorious expanse which awes and thrills, but American social space could also be sublime with the use of the camera. The distance that Douglas had traveled from slavery to self-actualization was literally vast. Douglas knew that photography had hel held the potential to help others also to bridge that chasm. His own very manhood was a result of picture-making imagination. The revenant, that word that I introduced earlier, is an effect of liveliness that is produced over time. It requires images that repeat or return, and to which we also may return multiple times to try to comprehend the intentions of its makers, their makers, and what has happened to the fulfillment of the aims of the image. The revenant belongs as much to the future as to the past, as we project the persistence of liveliness that it in inserts into the historical record, and thus it is in part a political concept, the appropriation and resignification of a scientific technology to serve the ends of freedom. The revenant appears when we contemplate not a single photographic image, but images in sets and strings. And I will briefly examine here a string of the multiple photographic portraits that Douglas had made of himself over time. Let me see one of the early ones up there. In this series, I propose, it is possible to discern decisions Douglas had made about himself over time. In this series, um, he's uh, re repeatedly making decisions about self-representation, and we can watch him holding firm to a particular interpolation into the American canon of illustrious men. Rather than masks of objection imposed upon a former slave, which is really what Roland Barthes does in his reading of William Casby, a former slave, uh, the Avedon photograph in uh, Camera Lucida, the Douglas portraits are a different kind of social cover. And I'm just going to go through them. And you can see the string over time as you watch them age.
They are signs of distinction assumed deliberately by a man who once had been denied it. The series of Douglas's images displays what an isolated or a single moment in time cannot. The vital, active, supple, subtle, informed and determined will of an individual who is much more incorporated into the zeitgeist than what many of our imaginations or many of our historians tell us he was or could have been possible for one who had been born and raised as chattel. Subtle differences appear as the subject ages, yet the continuity of his address to the camera and through it to the spectator and through it to the future is remarkable. Perhaps it is worth noting that in the sophistication of the management of his pose, Douglas may be paired once again with Lincoln, who also curated a photographic image carefully and consistently over time. But be that as it may, it is the visibility of the evidence of his choices over time that produces Douglas as the revenant. For we see in the images something of how consistent Douglas was in his self-portrayal, how he thought about addressing the camera, and how he was imagining the promise of photographic portraiture generally in accordance with his views of photography in pictures in progress. We see that is to say, Douglas making choices as a living man. I've arranged a string of images chronologically from early to late. In the first one, uh, now I'm gonna have to go back again. Is that gonna be all right? Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, we'll go back. It's the time I want you to see. That's why I'm going through it this way. Um, in this first one, which is assigned by historians to the late 1840s, Douglas is a young man in his 20s, a firebrand raising to, rising to fame in his career as an orator. In the last, from the end of the 19th century, taken near the end of his life in 1895, Douglas is an old man, worn by the effects of age and responsibility, but still maintaining his consciousness of admission that transcends his own mortality. And in between are other photographs in which the maturation of the man from youth to elder statesman is visible. What is striking to me in all these images, taken over the span of nearly half a century, is the consistency of the pose. It is true that widely accepted photographic convention dictated the three-quarter bust, the oblique angle, and the gaze directed toward the right as the viewer sees it, just as we read from, right to, from left to right as our timelines move forward from early to late and as we <coughs> signify the space of the future. But here we see Douglas presenting himself with extraordinary consistency in many sittings by many photographers over decades beyond the requirements of the customary pose. Even in the middle image where his body is turned the other way, he bears himself in virtually the same way as in all the others. There are, of course, many distinctions between and among the images. In the earlier one, there's a gold chain, and there, are, and there are ruffles on his shirt. Then they make Douglas into a little bit of a dandy compared to the later images. In the second two, hmm. I'm sorry. Well, OK, let's do, I'd want the mustache. <laughs> Good. Um, he, grows a, uh, he grows a handsome mustache while his hair becomes streaked and distinguished and gray. Later, it turns entirely white and he grows a full beard. The suit and the vest in the last three images are the same. They differ from the suits in the earlier two, as if a younger exuberance has given way to an economy of purpose in his middle years, where there is perhaps less time for and less interest in expenditure and <coughs> such vanity. The deep furrow over the bridge of his nose is consistent, marking him throughout. The piercing eyes and the resolute mouth are steady too, if not exactly replicated, although by the end of this series, the beard is helping to jut forward a chin that may have lost some of its thrust to age. They are all pictures of a handsome man who has led an exceptional life, but they are also pictures of Douglas's attempt to make it a representative life, that is to represent life and introduce the formerly excluded black man into the national pantheon. Most Americans in the middle of the 19th century who referred to photography were decidedly not discoursing of Negroes, as Douglas put it in the second Pictures in Progress lecture. In 1850, Matthew Brady, 
to take a well-known example, had published an album of 12 lithographs made after daguerreotypes called The Gallery of Illustrious Americans. This album included figures such as John Calhoun, Henry Clay, and Daniel Webster, all of whom played prominent roles in compromises intended to avoid the sectional conflict that resulted a decade later in war. As Brady's co-author in this project, Edward Lester, C. Edwards Lester wrote in the text, Brady's album grouped together those American citizens who from the tribune and in the field in letters and the arts have rendered the most signal service to the nation since the death of the father of the Republic. These serviceables men were all portrayed as sons of George Washington. The purpose, as Alan Trachtenberg has noted, was to unify Americans in a figurative domestic circle that would diminish the threat of division, section, and partisanship. But no black men or women of any color were included in the family. The gallery of illustrious Americans veiled the fear at the heart of the book, fear of disunion descending into fratricide. It pushed even further aside any acknowledgments of cross-racial family ties. When he first lectured in about photography in 1861, Douglas might well have thought that American, African-American sons and brothers would soon appear in such national albums. He trusted that photographs, along with other inventions of the 19th century, would bring, as remember he wrote, the world into brotherly kindness. But by the time he rewrote that talk in 1865, he had lost the family illusion. The more than one million casualties of the fratricidal civil war did not support the autodidact's confidence that brotherhood was the basis for lasting peace and progress. Instead, in his new version of the lecture, Douglas made a critical move away from the familiar. Unlike so many of his contemporaries, this time Douglas offered the truth of photography as an antidote to sentiment. For Douglas, the nation's greatness was not threatened by disunion. It had been made possible only by that disunion, and only new visions of progress could consecrate that death. A solemn Lincoln might tell the country to hope for the future, but Douglas believed that photography would have to materialize that future first in order for hope to survive. What we have in this string of images, I believe, is evidence of how determined Douglas was to insert himself into the gallery as a living image of that progress. Such a degree of consistency as he displays has to be willed. Even while other kinds of pictures of him also exist, they do not diminish the significance of this particular performance. Over time, when Douglas might easily have wavered, he did not. As Revenant, he apparently gathered himself up in each and every instance and projected his vision of a more perfect likeness of the nation. <laughs>